A reading from the history of the early church as told in the book of Acts chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the candidate, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you were reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Well, good morning. I'm glad to see all of you here today. I want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are here. Uh, We have some of the best fathers in the world at Community Christian Church. I'm praying for you. It's a hard job uh, that you're doing with your kids, but you'll be thankful one day that you put in the prayer and the effort and the work to get here on a Father's Day to show your kids what really matters because, you know, you'll kill for your kids, but one day you don't want to have to kill your kids for your grandkids. (laughs) and they're going to raise them, and you want them to to do a good job, So, uh, and you want them to know the Lord that you know. So before I get started today, I have a special opportunity for the 930 service, which is today uh, you're going to get to see some people be baptized. And so uh, we have two people that uh, have become, started coming to our church, uh, took the next step class like you're invited to all the time, and one of the steps in that, it's not the first step, but one of the steps along the way is that uh, you're challenged to think about Jesus, making him leader of your life, and to be baptized. Uh, baptism is the place, it is the moment where you stand before people and you say, Jesus, he's my Lord, and I want everybody to know. And I'm burying my old life underwater, and I'm rising to walk a new life with him. So uh, today, you're going to get to witness that. Hey everybody, these are my friends, Lena and John. Can you say hello to them? <laughs> They've both been a part of our church for a while and uh, been following Jesus and really just felt him saying their next step in obedience is to do what you're going to see today. And so, uh, Lena, John, I'm going to ask you guys uh, in front of all these people uh, what I know already to be true. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again? Are you here today to make him the leader of your life? Yes. All right. So, based on that confession, it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, John, based on that confession as well, my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for the two of them. God, we pray right now for John and for Lena and these new lives that have, well, come to the point where they they saw how attractive what you have to offer is, interactive life with the God of the universe through what Jesus has done for us. We pray that you would bless them, that you would strengthen them, that you would help our church to surround them and support them in whatever ways we need to, to help them become fully formed in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I'm going to save some of you the embarrassment. They are not married. Don't walk up and say, hey, you and your wife got baptized today. Not married. They are two separate individuals. I just know how people are going to sit here all day and try to put things together. Not married. Not married. Not married. So just take that off your mind. Okay. 
So uh, I'm so excited today to get to talk to you about a passage of scripture that when I got assigned to talk about this today, I didn't realize because I've talked about the passage before, but I've never taught the passage before. And it's the most unlikely story that you just heard read. It's unlikely because how it starts, really unlikely and how it ends. It's unlikely because the person who's uh, in this story that is baptized, unlikely because of the person that does the baptizing. And I think if you can prepare yourself and right now even say, Lord, um, open my mind and heart, I think that the, as surprised as the people are in this story, uh, God should surprise you in the next few minutes if you'll allow him to. You know how people will sometimes say, if you're in a, somewhere, they say, hey, we need some out-of-the-box thinking. And what they're meaning is, hey, we, need, we don't need the same old ideas. We need, we need to brainstorm new ways of thinking about things. Well, in spite of what a lot of people think, because of the way a lot of theologians have drawn the box around God, I think God is the most out-of-the-box out thinker in, on, in the universe. I mean, God is constantly doing things, if, if you notice, that just don't, they don't go the way we, we think. Ha, have you noticed that? That God just moves in ways that you're shocked when you hear people talk about him, that he just does incredible things. And uh, what you're going to see in this story today is that this out-of-the-box God just keeps on moving that way. I think it's one of the things that most surprised people about Jesus. I mean, Jesus would come and he would openly say, in spite of what some people might think, Jesus would just say to people, hey, I'm God in the body. I'm God. And then he would do things that they would prove. I mean, only God could do what he did. And then in the, on the other hand, He'd do or say things that definitely were not in the box of God things. And they would go, I don't get it. You do things over here that are like God, and it makes sense that you're God, and then you do and say things that don't fit right in the box of what we thought God would be like. You know, the Holy Spirit, as we watch in the book of Acts, as we've been reading these God stories, I mean, he just follows a pattern. You remember how Jesus was? You remember the first miracle that Jesus did? Anybody remember what the first miracle was? Water into wine. I mean, it just blew them away because he takes water, he turns it into wine, and it's good wine. It's not box wine. It's good. <laughs> it's good wine. And it still surprises people. I mean, people all across our country are preachers that are still surprised by it, and they do the miracle of turning Jesus' wine into grape juice it, because they're just shocked that God would turn water into wine because they think somehow drinking's not allowed. I mean... The Holy Spirit just picks up that thing when we go into the book of Acts and he keeps doing things that are out of the box. I mean, one of the things you'll notice is how there are things that happen and it just shocks everybody. Well, one of the things that's going to happen in this story is, I believe, the Holy Spirit's going to take something that could have just, you know, it could have just destroyed the church. It's one of those things that could have happened. It's the thing that all churches I know, particularly churches in the United States, we pray that would never happen. It would never happen in our day. We do not want it to happen in our day. And the Holy Spirit takes this thing that happens to this early church, and he turns it into the thing that finally gets them doing what God wanted to, to happen. I mean, you know how there are things that you can wait on. Waiting's a part of life. It's just part of what you have to do, but nobody likes to wait. There's some things you can't wait, wait on, like if you smell smoke when you're going to bed at night, nobody who's got a brain goes, I'll check that out in the morning. <laughs> or if you feel pain in your arm and a pressure on your chest, nobody goes, good thing I've got a cardiologist appointment in three months. There are things in life you can't wait on. You just can't wait. And the mission of God is one of those things. I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago when we started this little book of Acts, Jesus is about to leave, and he says to his apostles, you're going to be my witnesses. And notice he says, in Jerusalem first, and that's where the church has been birthed, and then in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's really clear when you read that, Jesus expects his movement to move. He expects it to, to go forth and do what he's asked it to do. But in case you haven't noticed, for the first seven chapters of Acts that we've been reading, it ain't moving. It's right there in Jerusalem, right where it started. And the Holy Spirit is going to get them moving. Here's what I want you to understand. If the accounts we read about Jesus' life are 
are true, which I believe they are. I mean, if Jesus really is the resurrected Son of God who ascended to the throne, who now reigns and rules over the whole planet, if that's true, then that's true for everybody. And it's true for anybody. And that means we have to stop thinking as followers of Christ that faithfulness to Jesus is separate from being on mission with Jesus. Being on mission with Jesus is faithfulness to Jesus. We can't think about some followers of Jesus who carry out the mission and the rest of us that are just sort of faithfully engaged. Being on mission with God, we're all engaged. The whole body of Christ is engaged. So when you read throughout all of Scripture, you have this rhythm. People of God come together and gather like we are now. And then we're scattered. We gather, we come together, and then we're scattered. And gathering is a regular part of the rhythm of what it takes to be a faithful witness to what Jesus has to do in the world. But let's be clear. We don't gather to escape the world. We don't gather for any reason to point the finger at anybody in the world and how the world is going wrong. We gather to encourage each other, to renew the strength of each other, to, so that we can go into the world and be a faithful witness to the kingdom of God. We're called to be salt and light in the world. But anybody who's ever lived in the South, as long as a lot of us have, know that in the summertime, salt can get stuck in the salt shaker. And when it does you got to get in there and get some pressure on it. you have to put some pressure against it to get it out of the salt shaker. Well, that's where this story that is so unlikely gets started. The Holy Spirit takes what could have been a terrible thing, and it takes the pressure to push it out of the salt shaker. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Did you notice where they went? Have you heard those two places before? Those are the places that Jesus had already told them they should have been going. They should have already gone to Judea and Samaria. And the Holy Spirit's going to take this chance when the world thinks we're going to persecute it. And the word scattered is, it's the word that a farmer uses when he goes out and he just sows seeds. The Holy Spirit's going to scatter the church out into the world when the persecution breaks out, and the Holy Spirit is going to push them. This is what the Holy Spirit's doing in this church. This great persecution of the early church begins with a man named Stephen. He was a leader in the early church assigned to take care of the Greek widows who weren't getting the same kind of treatment as the Jewish widows. He looked out for outsiders. Luke tells us that he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So one day, Stephen goes to the synagogue of the freedmen, which was a place for Jewish people who came from other countries outside of Jerusalem. And Luke makes a point to tell us it's for those from Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as from the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. Now Cilicia matters because the capital of that province is a place called Tarsus. And there was a young man from Tarsus named Saul who was there listening to Stephen. Stephen is teaching a message that God is reaching out to all people through Jesus. All people can come to God now through him. Up until this point, the people in Jerusalem might not have liked the Christians, but they thought they were like a weird sect of Judaism. But now these Christians are now spreading like wildfire. So the enemies of the church think, let's pour some water on that fire by killing some of them. What they didn't know is that the persecution doesn't pour water on the fire of the Spirit. It's more like gasoline. So the people listening file false charges against Stephen, saying he is preaching against the temple, saying it's going to be destroyed. He's preaching against Moses' law, saying we need to change it. And then Luke adds this detail, that Stephen's face shone like an angel. Now, that's a big deal because there is another person in Jewish history whose face shone like this. It was Moses, their greatest prophet. So with a glowing face like Moses, Stephen begins to preach, and he answers their claims that he's preaching against Moses' law and the temple by teaching them their own history, which they hate. He says first, God has always worked outside of the temple. Abraham, Joseph, Moses, all before the temple. 
Also, the scriptures prove that God constantly shows up outside of Israel. You can't put God inside of a box. Second, no one in Israel can get that upset about keeping the law, because Israel has never been good about keeping the law. Third, Israel has always rejected the people God chooses. Joseph's brothers rejected him. The people often rejected Moses. Israel killed the prophets of God, and now they have rejected their own Messiah, Jesus. And so Stephen found out what a lot of Jesus followers in our country have found through the years. People like their history just as long as you don't tell the truth of what really happened. So people covered their ears and started screaming back at Stephen, like they're on Facebook or something. They dragged him out of the city and they stoned him. And Luke tells us they laid their coats at the feet of a young man from Tarsus named Saul. We're going to talk more about him next week. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. In the moment of his death, Stephen utters the same kind of words as Jesus. You see, part of being a faithful witness to Jesus means you should expect that you'll get treated like Jesus was treated. It's why Jesus' closest friend, Peter, tells us, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Adversity and opposition has always been the Holy Spirit's greatest opportunity to use disciples and to show our faithful witness. So we're told that after Stephen's death, this great persecution of the church scattered them throughout Judea and Samaria. And one of these followers is Philip. He is scattered to Samaria and we're told that there was great joy in the city because of his presence. Great mourning and persecution in Jerusalem led to great joy in Samaria. God does not always work as we expect, but the mission of Jesus went forward because the disciples were willing to be faithful and to do the work of the Spirit, no matter what they faced or where they ended up. William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army, was subject to terrible criticism and scorn. His son brought him a newspaper clipping of one of the latest attacks on him, and he said to his son, In 50 years, it's not going to matter what anybody thought of us. The only thing that's going to matter was that we did stay faithful to the work of God. This is what the early church understood. God does not always work the way that we want or expect. God cannot be put in a box. But if we simply listen and follow where He leads, there is great joy on the other side. So a few moments ago, we sang, our God is an unstoppable God who does impossible things, right? But as we are learning right now, he does those unstoppable, impossible things in ways we would never anticipate. So Jesus' final command to his followers, remember? He said, go, make disciples. And that word that he uses, go, it, it really is better translated as you go while you're going about your life wherever you might go while you go make disciples I think many of us really want to help people find their way back to God I believe that most Christ followers would say they do but we often have a specific person in mind when we think that and we pray and we look for opportunities and often we get disappointed when God doesn't show up and move in the way that we expect him to but just maybe God is asking us instead to open our eyes to see more to see the places and more people around us that he's working with people that you might not ever expect now that brings me to this you might be sitting on it it was in your chair when you walked in today it's a car mirror tag that we provided you with I want you to get it and just take a look at it. I want you to keep in mind uh, that these images, what they might mean for you. To see on it, you see images of places that you might go or during your day or during your week. And you'll also notice there's a prayer printed right at the bottom. Here's my challenge. I want you to take this car tag and I want you to place it in your car where you'll see it. And every time you get into your car and then every time you get out of your car, I want to challenge you to pray that prayer that's on the bottom of that tag. I just want this to be a reminder to you and to me 
that we could always be looking out for whatever opportunities God may have for us as we interact with people and help them find a way for them to join God in the life that he's offered. So right now, I'm going to give you just a minute to look at the images on this tag. And I want you to reflect on your upcoming week. Where are the places that you're going to be going? You're going to go to work, maybe. Your kids' sports practices. The gym. The grocery store. I want to encourage you to take this this moment of silence. I want you to think about how you might be more intentional with your time in all of these locations. Maybe this simply means when I go into these spaces, I'm not going to wear earbuds and zone out and tune everybody out. I'm not going to be scrolling on my phone mindlessly while people walk back and forth in front of me. I'm actually going to look at people. I'm going to make eye contact with them. I'm going to smile. I'm going to introduce myself when it's appropriate. Would you just use this next minute and ask God to lead you through your week? And my guess is he's going to bring some people, a person, or some places to your mind. Just do that right now in the moment of silence. God, thank you for always being with us. Teach us to be faithful with your instructions to go make disciples wherever we go. Help us to expect you to show up in these unexpected ways and with people that we might never expect so that we may be able to help others find what we have found in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So now uh, let's get to the account you heard earlier. There's a most unlikely story with the most unlikely people that well, Leah read to us when I came up this morning. What you see in this story, we've already talked about how the Holy Spirit takes pressure and he finally gets the church to move outside of Jerusalem and to the areas that Jesus had told them they would go and eventually they'll go to all the world. But what we're going to see in this story is that the God who couldn't get boxed in into Jerusalem won't be boxed in by their customs of who can actually come near to God. You see in this story a God who's going to break down the barriers that they thought were excluding some people. This story is it's about somebody who felt like they could, they could never come. Now, you'll notice in this story the way the person is described is He's an Ethiopian official who the Bible tells us is a very high official. Nothing less than the Secretary of Treasury of serving a, the, a Candace, some of your uh, translations will say, who's the queen of the Ethiopians. Now, we aren't given this guy's name in the book of Acts. And one of the things that I love discovering during my study of this passage was that we do know his name. Irenaeus, who's a second century church father, who was the disciple of Polycarp, who's a first century church father, who was a disciple of John, who writes the books in the Bible, who's a disciple of Jesus. That's how close these people are. He says his name was Simon Barcus. And now, Simon Barcus is a young man that when he was just a little boy, what we'd call an elementary school boy, he's kidnapped from his family. He's taken from his family, and the first thing he's done when he's brought to the royal palace of the Kandiki is that when he's brought in, they castrate him immediately. Now, if you don't know what that means, you'll notice all the men winced, and you can ask them about that later. It'll be a fun conversation. But 
when he gets brought in, they, they castrate him. And they do that to a lot of boys that they kidnap because as they turn them into eunuchs, what begins to happen is, well, they don't have any people. They can never have a family. They can never have the temptations that other people will have. And they'll often be used to guard the women's quarters in the royal palace. Now, this particular place where he's captured is ruled by a group of female monarchy for hundreds of years. It's not a, it's not a king, it's a queen. And Candace is not her name. The Can Candiki, uh, Candace is the name like Pharaoh or Caesar. It's what they called the king. It's who she is, the queen. And so he eventually does his job so well that Simon Barcos, he rises. We don't know how long. It takes him a long time, I bet. But he continues to be faithful in all of his duties until he becomes the secretary of treasure for the whole country. And as you can imagine, he's very close to the queen. But because he has no family, he's also all alone. We don't really know how it happened, but somewhere we're told the story that he begins to hear about the worship of this Jewish religion, that they worship one true God, and he becomes interested in it. We don't really know how that happens, but he decides, because he has the freedom to do so, that he's going to travel all the way to Jerusalem to worship this God that he's heard about, that he's interested in. I didn't have time to put a map together to show you, but we know that the where the Kandiki were, it's what we would call South Sudan now. And so their capital city is a place called Kush. It's a 1,700-mile journey that he has to make from the capital city to Jerusalem. It takes him probably two months to make the journey in a chariot. He travels all the way, but what he hasn't learned when he read about the king of the Jews is that when he gets there, he will not be allowed to worship. He'll go to the temple, but they will not let him close. See, what he hadn't read is that no eunuch could ever come to the temple. No eunuch could ever come, come near. We're also told that he's an Ethiopian, and I want to point out something to you that you'll probably miss if you just read it with 21st century eyes. We think Ethiopian, and we think the country of Ethiopia, but what we know for sure is there was no country of Ethiopia when this is originally uh, written. So they're actually talking not about the country he's from, they're talking about his skin tone. They're telling us what he looked like. And by telling us that he's Ethiopian, they're telling us that he's from Africa, which they're saying to all the Jewish people, he isn't like us. He's not from the Middle East. He's not Semitic. He's not Arabic. He's not Egyptian. He's not Persian. He's not Greek. He's not Roman. He's black. He's from Africa. And what that means when he gets to Ethiopia is he's an oddity. He's a little exotic. And people will want to notice him. They'll want to point him out. But because he's not Jewish and because they find out he's a eunuch, they will have nothing to do with him because to have to do with him will make them unclean as well. So this Ethiopian high official goes all the way to Jerusalem. Two months he travels in a chariot. He travels all the way to Jerusalem to worship. And when he gets there, he's not included. Then there's Philip. Now this isn't Philip who's the disciple of Jesus, this is Philip who along with Stephen is one of the seven that's chosen to serve the church. Way back when we read about the disagreement that rises up between the Greek-speaking Jewish women, uh, widows, and the Hebrew-speaking Jewish widows. And all they're telling you by saying the Greek-speaking Jewish widows is they ain't from here. They're a little different than everybody else. And so when it comes to the distribution of food, they didn't get as much as everybody else. So the apostles learn about it, and they set out qualifications. And I want you to notice the qualifications that the, the apostles gave for people to serve food. They said they must be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So in order to wait, wait tables in the early church, you had to be known as a person who listened to the Holy Spirit and responded to his call, which makes you full of wisdom. Well, once Stephen's killed, the persecution breaks out, and the, his job with feeding widows in Jerusalem is done. So Philip, along with the rest of the seven, they scatter. And it says that when he goes out, 
Eventually, what he does what he does in that chapter, it says, an angel of the Lord came to Philip and said to him, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. Now, I don't have time to read the whole scripture to you, but what I can point out to you, if you do go back and read it today, is he's now in Samaria. Samaria is north of Jerusalem, and he's just been told, I want you to go south uh, to the road. So he's got to go back through Jerusalem where they're trying to kill people like him. He's got to go from the north back to the south. And he, what he doesn't know, what God knew, is that he's going, as he's going on the road south, he's going to meet somebody that he was supposed to meet. On his way, he meets an Ethiopian eunuch who had traveled to Jerusalem to worship the God of the Jews, but he had not been allowed to worship. He's a court official of Queen's Court of Candace, the Ethiopians. He's in charge of his treasury, and he sees him in the chariot. And as he comes along, the Spirit says to him, go to that chariot, go near it. And Philip hears the guy reading from Isaiah about... The, 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 the great suffering uh, Savior that's to come. And he says to the guy, do you know who that's about? Do you understand what you're reading? And Simon Barco says, how can I? Unless somebody explain it to me, how can I understand this? And we're told that from that scripture, Philip began to point him to Jesus. Now, I'm not told all of this in the scripture. Part of it we're told, but I've read this scripture enough to imagine how that conversation is going. We're told that he says to Simon, who's he talking about? Is he talking about as a prophet? Is Isaiah talking about himself? Or is he talking about someone else? Who is this suffering servant that he's writing about? And I think at that moment, Philip realizes, this is why I'm here. And a little smile comes on his face and he goes, that's a great question. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about someone else. His name is Jesus. He was a mighty prophet of God. In fact, he was way more than a prophet. He was the Messiah. He was the promised one. He came to us. He did miracles that everyone could see. He taught us that God wasn't who we thought he was. He told us that God had opened the way so that people could come into the kingdom and have interactive life with God. And he told us, that even the Gentile could draw close to God and worship. In fact, one time, Simon, we went to the temple, and they had taken the court of the Gentiles where people who didn't know God were supposed to draw close, and they had made it a marketplace. He said, you've made it a den of thieves, and you've kept people away from me. And Simon goes, I know. I read that that was supposed to be a, a house of prayer for all people. A house of prayer for all people. But they wouldn't let me in. They wouldn't let me pray. And I can imagine Philip saying, I know. I'm sorry. But you should know the same people who wouldn't let you in, they, they excluded Jesus too. They told him that he didn't honor things in the right way as well. Eventually, they arrested him. They lied about him. They took him to the Romans and they killed him. And I can imagine tears coming in Simon's eyes. And Philip says to him, Simon, that's not the end. He rose from the dead. He proved who he was by resurrecting from the dead. He's ascended to the throne and he reigns and he makes himself available to all people who will turn their feet, repent of the way they're walking and turn toward him and walk and follow him and begin to follow him by trusting him that he will lead you to do what you need to do. You see, Simon, Jesus is building his temple, but he isn't using stones like the Jewish people did. He's using living stones of people who will come together and they will form his body across the whole world. and They will publicly show their commitment to him him by being baptized like he was. And I think Simon's eyes are wide open and he sees it and he says, stop, stop. Look, Philip, there's water. What will prohibit me now? What special rule will prohibit me now from being baptized? And Philip says, 
if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, with all your heart, you can be baptized. And Simon says, I do. I do. And so they go down into the water, and he baptizes them. And Acts 8.39 says that when he came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. What does that mean? I got no clue. Because we serve an out-of-the-box God, and he don't tell us everything. I have no clue what it means. The eunuch never saw him again. And Philip, he suddenly finds himself way back north of Jerusalem in a place that in just a few weeks we're going to read about an encounter with a Roman soldier. What an unlikely convert. What an unlikely person to teach him. It's why it's such a surprising story. One more thing I want to say to you, and then I'll be done. You know, I think somewhere along the way, I guess starting in my generation, maybe it was before, people have convinced Christians in the United States that nobody in our country is really interested in Jesus anymore. And that if we, have, if we do talk to somebody about Jesus, we have to raise the interest. We're going to have to make them interested. I mean, it's up to us to broach the subject and to force our way in and give these weird little tracks that we throw out and people go, what the heck is that? I have found that that is a lie. The Holy Spirit is fully alive. And right now, in every place on this planet, with every person on this planet, there is a God that loves them more than you can imagine. And he is at work in them. And it's only our job to go out and say, God, where am I to join you in your work? My job is not to create the interest, to cause repentance, to draw anybody to God. I do not take God to people. God was there before I got there. My job is just to discover and help them along the way. But to do that, you're going to have to get out of your box. You're going to have to stop thinking about God the way you've been thinking about it and your little devotion to Him being something you do in a quiet time in the morning. And you're going to have to think about the fact that Jesus is on the move and He expects His movement to move. So as you're going, you keep your eyes and your ears open and listen for His call and you never know what adventure he might take you on. Now, I don't know what you needed to hear today. You might be here, and what you needed to hear is, I felt excluded by the church my whole life long for things that I did or even things they imagined I might have done, and you felt like the barriers are up. I will tell you the truth is, there is no barrier between you and God except the ones that you caused by not turning your feet to face Jesus. You turn your feet to follow him. He will lead you to be the person God wants you to be. The Holy Spirit is calling every person. Maybe you needed to hear that. And our family is open to help you take a next step. Or maybe what you needed to hear is that the voice of the Spirit is willing to speak to any follower and lead them on an adventure if you'll be open. He's speaking to you all the time. Probably you aren't listening. You probably haven't opened yourself up to hear. So I want to give you a chance to have some time to listen and respond. And Jason's going to lead us in that. So once again, like Ed said, God's Spirit is constantly with us. He's constantly speaking. Just in ways we don't expect Him to. And that's why we miss it. So how can we just stop and listen and be really open? So I want to ask you a few questions today. What is your next step in learning how to interact and respond to the Spirit of God? I want to call your attention back to that car tag that we looked at earlier. 
I want to challenge you to just think of one place. Pick one place on that tag that you're going to begin to pray for this week. And as you keep this reminder with you throughout the week, I want to remind you to pray. God, would you lead me in this place? Before you enter whatever place that you've picked, just pray that prayer at the bottom of that tag and ask God's spirit to be at work in you in that place. God, open my eyes to see what you see. God, open my ears that I might hear the way that you're hearing. And God, open my hands so that I might give in the way that you would give if you were here. Let your will be done through me. And then I just most importantly want to say, keep your heart open to whatever it is that God might have in store for you. Did you notice what God called Philip to do while he was traveling? The command that the Spirit gave Philip was, he said, go and just stand by that chariot. Go stand over there. And with that, Philip not only obeyed, did you notice what Philip did? He said he ran to the chariot. (laughs) Now I want you to be honest with yourself. How many times has God prompted your heart and told you to do something and you thought it was just inconsequential just go stand over there and you just brush it off see the problem is we get so narrow minded on what God wants us to do and what God is asking from us that we ignore these very simple signs that he's giving us the call of the Holy Spirit that you feel in your life it would be meaningless if you're not willing to just do what he says and to act upon it I want to say to those of you who are maybe new to our church or new to the whole Christianity thing that some of this today might have sounded a little weird to you, and I I get that. Maybe you're new to faith, you're not sure what you believe, and you're just wanting to learn what does this really mean, this interactive life with God and His Spirit, and you're unsure of even what that looks like. Can I just one more time encourage you? We want to help you start that journey. And that's why we offer the Next Steps class. Would you sign up for that today so that we can begin to partner with you to investigate life with God and life with our community? Now, in just a few moments, uh, our band's going to come back, and they're going to lead us in a song reminding us of God's love and that this love is really meant to be shared with others, and that's going to help us focus our heart. But before we sing that song, I just want to give you another minute, just some quiet time. And I want to ask you to use this time and just... In the silence, prayerfully reflect on what your next step in learning how to interact and respond to God's Spirit might be. So let's do that right now. Hey there. Thanks for stopping by to check out this message. If you've been feeling the call to take your next step in following Jesus, we're here to support you every step of the way. Feel free to reach out to us at community-christian.net or connect with us on any of our social media platforms. And hey, I'm super excited to share that we've got two amazing podcasts you might really enjoy. First up, there's Three Peas in a Pod, where three of our speakers dive deep into questions about the Bible and life. Then there's Not Great Parents, which is just perfect for us parents navigating the ups and downs of parenthood. Both of these podcasts release fresh episodes every week, so make sure to tune in and give them a listen.